let me first start by 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 thanking all the the organizers of this super nice workshop. What where I'm learning a lot actually. Uh, so thank you for for the invitation. So today um, I will I will discuss uh, different type of systems again in the in the context of a phenomena induced by fluctuating electromagnetic fields. Uh, but this time probably in a in a different type of uh, system. So uh, Roman Kaiser before uh, discussed uh, systems, atomic systems and systems found in astrophysics. So to say from the infinitely small world to the infinitely large world, I will try to focus today about in uh, let let me say the infinitely medium sized systems. <laughs> say, in, in condensed matter. So uh, this is where we work in Freiburg uh, in, in, in Switzerland, not Germany, not Novo Friburg in, in, <laughs> in Brazil. Uh, and we work, uh <coughs> I work actually in collaboration with Frank Scheffel, which should be around here uh, in the group of soft matter and, and photonics uh, in, in the physics department of the University of, of Freiburg. Uh, which is a pretty, well, this is a picture of a few months ago, now the group changed. And uh, we do theory together with uh, Augustin Muster, which is sitting there and presenting a poster today, and our postdoc, Diego Romero. So we are suppos supposed to do the theory and simulation in the, in the group, uh, particularly, particularly in light transport <coughs> in complex media, and also uh, interactions induced by optical forces, right, between different systems. Also, in the context of optical forces, the nowadays experimentalists in the group are uh, Zi Chi Zhang and Jose Muñetón, who is a PhD student, and they do optical twisting, which I will consider a bit today also, right? So this is a list of collaborations, uh, collaborators uh, from well, well known in this, some, some of them, uh, some of them from Portugal, uh, Germany, France. Uh, so in the last years, we are strongly uh, collaborating, of course, within the group uh, uh, with many other people in particular. Let me, you know, the guy I put last here is the last, but certainly not the least. He was uh, our good friend Juan Josant, who introduced me at least to this field and who sadly passed away almost two years ago already. So what is soft matter? This is, uh, I try to say this is the infin infinitely medium sized systems. If I had to summarize, and I don't consider myself an expert on soft matter, but I see roughly three main ingredients in soft matter systems. One is the building blocks, of course. As uh, we heard before, uh, more is different by, <laughs> So it's, it's a well-known quote, and this is particularly true in this kind of system. So the, in, in soft matter, uh, we find building blocks, building up the interactions and the properties of the systems, all the way down to molecules. I wouldn't probably say individual atoms. This is another field already. All the way up to uh, even uh, full uh, living organisms, which are under study currently in this type of, of systems, passing through a, a, a building blocks uh, of a, with a size which is around a micron. This is the typical size in, in a, a soft matter system, right? So a second main ingredient, of course, the interactions. Particularly in soft matter physics, we find a rich variety of interactions. A, direct mechanical interactions or you know of electrostatic and magnetostatic uh, nature entropic forces uh, mediated by very complex chemical environments for instance what we find typically in biology a uh, cell is a uh, building block in, in in biology but also in in soft matter physics right and of course electrodynamic interactions right in particular induced by black body radiation right in so to all of this, we have to add fluctuations, right? Thermal fluctuations, which are relevant, uh, extremely relevant in particular in the 
this in the support system. So, for instance, we can discuss as yesterday we almost dedicated the, the entire day to to discussing what we may call dispersion forces. Uh, so I won't insist too much on this. I learned a great deal yesterday. Now I don't even know how to call these things. I mean, yesterday was clear what is the difference between Van der Waals, London, and Casimir Lipschitz, but now I. I don't feel brave enough to say, okay, this is uh, Casimir, this is Casimir Lipschitz, this is, but anyways, you know, it's forces derived from electrodynamic interactions induced by fluctuating fields, right? Including the, the zero point fluctuations, etc. right? On top of this, quite typically, we have to add, uh, in particular in colloidal systems, which I will uh, narrow down the focus to this type of, of systems where uh, we have particles in a s liquid suspension with different you know, ions in solution, so different ionic strength, strength. So we have electrostatic, screened electrostatic interactions on, to on top of everything else, which are relatively well controlled. And this certainly is uh, very relevant in different fields, not only from our perspective of fundamental studies, but also in, in applications to in the, in the industry or in other sciences like biology, for instance, right? So this is a bit our, our uh, game today. And uh, from these structures, these uh, building blocks in interactions, in these uh, rich interactions, uh, we can expect to have different emergent phenomena, right? Ranging, I mean, in almost anything you can realize, from self-organization -organ and collective dy dynamics, which it is a herd of sheep, and it, it, there is quite some collective dynamics. Don't ask me too much about the interaction between the individual units here, but it, it works. Also in fish banks, uh, bird flocks, etc. and this is a matter of, of study, right, from, from people. Uh, of course, we have critical phenomena, uh, very common, or of course, very rich phenomenology re related to phase transitions. Uh, uh, emergence of hierarchical structures providing with some functionality and emergent responses, mechanical, electromagnetic, heat transport, etc. Right. So this is a bit our playground. Okay, now. Soft matter and photonics. This all we, we do some photonics in our group. Uh, let me just uh, snapshot a few of the examples of the things people is interested in this community through a few of the of the works we have been of systems we have been dealing with in our group. So we can combine soft matter and photonics in a number of ways. I will probably pass through three, so to say, main categories. One is to use what we know about soft matter, say polymer technology, self-assembly self concepts, etc., to create novel optical materials with a given functionality. So, uh, for instance, we can directly 3D print in, in the submicron uh, size regime uh, very complex structures uh, with a given optical functionality. This is one, one of the examples. It's quite literally a 3D printer a bit expensive, probably, uh, and then you need to do some post -pro chemical post-processing, post etc. Another thing one could do is use the type of thi this type of structures found in in, in soft matter to uh, get different photonic properties of matter from strongly correlated, if not fully ordered, like photonic crystal, to cor disordered materials, but uh, correlated. This is, uh, so to say, hot topic nowadays in the photonic community and also in soft matter. Uh, there's, there's hours of discussions and hundreds of papers around this. We were trying to summarize what we know, a group of people here in radio system uh, of modern physics. Already we started in 2018 and for a number of reasons, this, this uh, review is already in the archive. And I guess I could probably promise Frank that this will be released very soon, to me it's still six months, so who knows, right? So many things happened since the kickoff meeting in 2018, so some people is not here anymore. 
Uh, but you know, uh, there are newborns, people that move from one country to another or from one city to another. I can promise that we'll parish it, finally, right? What other things? Of course, we, and, and this is to some extent an obvious approximation, but it's difficult to really make it work. Use self-assembly concepts to make uh, photonic materials. For instance, materials showing uh, color response, right? So now, nowadays, excuse me, it is possible to uh, self-assemble uh, meta objects, made of smaller objects, whose uh, uh, optical response is picked and scattering picked at different wavelengths, um, but still small enough such that you, you can literally use them to print, like in a, in, in a using uh, inkjet uh, technology, right? This kind of thing. Not only this, we can also use optics, so kind of the other way around, we can use optics to test properties of soft matter. Of course, well known, uh, different scattering uh, probes we can use, uh, 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 static light scattering or dynamic light scattering diffusion with spectroscopy, etc. So you can measure even differential cross-sections of relatively complex structures in the laboratory. Uh, there is a full branch of research devoted to super resolution microscopy, which I, I won't discuss today, definitely. Uh, and of course, and this is a central piece, is uh, using optical forces uh, as a probing tool to learn something about matter, right? In soft matter, right? So for instance, here, this is just an example. It should be a video. Okay, you see here that this thing moves. And in this case, we are applying a opposite force in each of the members of this dimer, which is quite strongly, you know, chemically bound by, by DNA molecules. And we can push them apart up to the point of rupture, right? So at this point, the centers of the, these particles are uh, like around 40 nanometers apart. And at around a force of 20 piconewton, which is the standard force range in this kind of uh, systems, the two particles split apart, right? So there's a jump here in the distance. So this is technology we can use to address properties of uh, in soft matter systems. We can manipulate matter using optical forces, obviously, right? So this is a well, re relatively simple example. So we have a number of particles here uh, trapped by optical twisters that change in position. So from the point of view of the particles, it's like having a static, uh, a number of static traps. So if, if you switch quickly enough the trapping uh, for the particles at different, completely different time scales, you can trap them. Uh, and also, not only creating well-determined, predefined optical traps, but we can use uh, electromagnetic, random electromagnetic, oops, random electromagnetic fields that will induce interactions, right? So we are here to study this kind of system this, this week, not necessarily black body radiation, but fluctuating electromagnetic fields. And we can use this type of technology not only to create this uh, well-determined random electromagnetic field, but also to measure the interaction forces, right? So in the remaining minutes, and I should have still like 25, if I'm not wrong, <clears throat> okay, that's great. So I will try to focus in uh, three aspects here which are very closely related, not in this order. Actually, uh, I will first very kind of kindergarten approach to optical twisting. So experts in the room, please forgive me uh, to see uh, how interaction forces can be actually be measured quite accurately in this type of uh, soft matter system. Uh, then I will discuss 
a bit more in the detail, but not too much, because probably yesterday we already saw a, a big part of the formalism used, and it's not very different in this case, in, in SOCMAS system. Uh, if I have time, I would like to uh, take a small interlude to discuss an interesting system from the perspective of light transport, uh, and then the relation with this, uh, optical forces. And uh, I want to discuss then how can we, in principle, as a matter of principle, we'll see how easy or difficult it is, design interactions, interactions based on predefined uh, spectral patterns of our, I mean, the spectral density, essentially, of our random electromagnetic fields, right? So let's go for it. Uh, this uh, kindergarten introduction to optical twisting, trapping and manipulation. So imagine we have a lens, a convergent lens here, and we send a light beam at a given frequency, right? This one is strongly focused, and this uh, red spot here would be the focal point of this beam, right? Now, if we consider the scattered light or the light that passes through this lens, we see first that the light on the left, it goins, it, it's going on average upwards and is less spread angularly than the incoming one, right? So the output momentum with, will point up and it will be larger than the input momentum, right? So there's a momentum exchange, so there's a force on the lens applied by the optical beam. Right? This is pretty obvious and super well known in the gun. So th this lens will move down and right. Say the center of the lens will move towards the, uh, the fo focal point right, of this beam. So now if we focus, excuse me, okay, if we focus the beam on the other side, something similar will happen. Now the output momentum is smaller in, in, in modular, but it will also point up upwards, right? So now the momentum transfer, so the difference between the, these two momenta, uh, will make the lens move again, or the center of the lens move towards the focal point of the, of the focus, right? So in principle, we can use optical forces to pull and push mm, uh, massive objects by the optical forces, right? Of course, uh, this is super well known already for a long time. Uh, uh, Asking and many, many others definitely developed the, this technology from the very concept early in the 1970s to the practical working realization mid 1980s, if I'm not wrong. And today this is a standard tool in, in the laboratory, right? So let me just, without giving more details, uh, give a very simple but quite accurate expression of the total force acting on, a, on an object that might be, for instance, a colloidal particle, not a massive lens, but a colloidal, say, micron, a few microns in size particle. And the force for a given uh, electromagnetic field pattern at a given frequency will be given by this expression. So we take the real part is at a given frequency, okay? Uh, is the polarization currents times the, the okay, the, the interval of, of all that, the polarization current in the object induced by the input field, so by the beam, times the gradient of the field or the complex conjugate of the field in each of the of the x, y, z components, right? So this will give the total force. If we have a small particle that can be approximated by a single electric dipole induced by the input field, this would be the, the result of uh, taking this. And so there are two terms. One is, as discussed previously, a term which is proportional to the polarizability of the particle. We are considering this uh, real polarizability now. Uh, but this will change, times the gradient of the square of the field, so essentially the gradient of the intensity, and we see no sign here. So if the polarizability is positive, 
the particle will be pushed towards the high intensity regions, right, to the gradient. Of course, on top of this, we have a radiation pressure, right? So if, if the, this is the optical axis, the light, the light, the beam goes from bottom to top, there is an additional pushing force due to radiation pressure, okay? So if we can make this term overcome the radiation pressure, we can trap the particle, okay? Now, let me just show you a little example uh, of particle trapping. So we have a particle, you see, up. we have one high refractive index, small particle, like 300 nanometers in diameter silicon particle, and we trap one of them using an optical tweezer, single optical tweezer. You have seen that there is another one around that gets also trapped into the same. So now we form a pair, th there's a pair of particles there. So when we image this in using dark field microscopy, we see that there is a color in the, the, the a change in the color of the image, right? So now we know that there are two, two particles trapped inside a single uh, uh, optical tweezer here. Okay? We can do, as I said before, this optical uh, time shared optical tweezers. So we create one, we can scan using different methodologies. We can scan, steer the beam and put the beam at very precise different positions in such a way that uh, the particles trapped here will feel different forces. So we can push each of them in different directions. So we can perform this type of experiments that I was mentioning before. For instance, what is the force after which the, par the particles separate? So how much force should I apply to rupture this diamond, right? This type of technology, by the way, is used in biology for more than 20 years. So can we use this uh, type of approach to accurately measure optically induced interactions by random electromagnetic fields? The answer is yes. And actually this was realized roughly like 10 years ago in the group of Frank. And the idea is the following. So if we can generate a random electromagnetic field with a given spectrum, and now the spectrum will be a single laser line, so it's a delta, so to say, it's not a black body radiation spectrum, which will exist, of course, on top of all this. Uh, but this we cannot switch on and off. But what we can switch on and off is this laser creating this interaction force, right? So. Uh, on top of all the possible interactions, if the only difference is this switchable force, just by studying the statistics of the positions of the pair of particles of this diamond separated by a given distance, there is a difference in the statistics of the positions of the distances when the force is off or when the force is on. Imagine here is kind of the sketch, there is an attractive force. So if I don't move these two optical traps, the particles on average will come closer for an attractive interaction when I switch this on. So studying the fluctuations of the distance in time and comparing the on and off state of these switchable forces, uh, we essentially can determine the, determine the interaction potential between these two forces, pretty much like the Boltzmann factor, essentially. So what can be done here is we can create the traps, uh, put the traps at a given distance, trap two particles there, study the statistics of, I mean, the fluctuations in the distance when the force is off, then switch the force on, this FRL would be, and study the difference in the statistics. This uh, directly gives us the interaction potential. This is a very clever idea because you don't need to calibrate anything here. I mean, one of the problems usually in this type of experiments is the calibration step. In principle, this is self-calibrated, self right? This technique was discovered like some years ago. And so now the idea is, okay, how can we induce an interaction between two colloidal particles? And how can we measure the, I mean, uh, through a random electromagnetic field? And how can we measure this? 
the thing is, I mean, the idea is pretty simple. The practical realization is hard, right? So uh, at, time, at that time, like around 10 years ago, probably George Buga in our group uh, developed the, the now, now working for the railway system, I guess, in Switzerland, uh, developed this, this system. Uh, it was designed by Frank. After many more, many years of discussion with Juan Jose, and apparently the history says like 10 years after, they decided to uh, spend like two or three years uh, doing the, the, the setup. The idea is relatively simple. The realization is not simple. So first, we need the trapping forces, the optical twisters. So there is a laser, the very near infrared, that uh, so the beam will be steered by this galvano mirror, so it's oscillating at kilohertz, and so two traps will be created inside the cell, right? The two, uh, with a quite precise distance between them that we can change, obviously, right? Then we want to do statistics of the positions of the particle, the distances, right? So probably the best way is to image them. The problem is, okay, we have a one, two, four, five micron particles there, and you have to image them. Okay, so you send white light through the same objective, and then you image, uh, separate, take the white light, block the, the light of the trapping laser, and you can image this with, through a CCD and do statistics on the positioning. So it's kind of now there are like two optical systems in one. So the next thing, the third thing you need is to induce the optical switchable forces by random field. So you need your field, but you need to randomize it. So we work at a single frequency, 532 in this case, but it's a laser. How can you randomize it? So there, there is a single frequency, but still the spatial distribution of the field can vary, right? So it's not a zero size line, but essentially the variations in frequency are negligible in this case. And the thing is done in a pretty clever way. So the, this, in this laser passes through a two bit layer here that will scramble the, the field. So you have a speckle pattern, but this uh, beam is also steered by a galvano mirror, right? At kilohertz, the thing is the field seen by the particles essentially is isotropic, homogeneous, and randomized. So any phase polarization and K vector, any direction is possible is, we believe is roughly homogeneously distributed, right? So light comes from the top, it is uh, reflected uh, by a direct mirror from the bottom, right? So this creates this four pi isotropic illumi illumination. So this is the, so to say, uh, or it was state of the art a uh, few years ago and is as far as I can tell among the very few practical realizations of this thing. Obviously, <coughs> can we switch the interactions, the interaction on and off? Yeah, we just put a shutter and it's over. So difficult to do, simple to think about, right? So what happens then? I mean, what was the prediction uh, for the interactions induced by this random field? Okay. So essentially, uh, okay, we can think about two different terms. One is the spontaneous fluctuations of the dipoles in the material that will depend on the absorption level of the system, so fluctuation dissipation. If there is some dissipation, there's some fluctuation. If we use beads uh, which do not absorb or is uh, negligible the absorption, we can get rid of this contribution of the fluctuation, the fluctuating dipoles, right? So then all the interaction will come from the fluctuating, I mean, the, from the interaction between induced dipoles by the fluctuating field and the fluctuating field, right? So we can write the induced dipoles will be proportional to the total incoming field impinging onto this dipole, times the polarizability that will depend on the frequency, obviously. Uh, and we in, in include the radiation corrections, et cetera, to account for, for you know, full energy conservation or energy balance is what you can say. Now, let's suppose we have two objects, B and A, 
and we split these objects A and B in small boxes, if you wish, right? So you, you can already see that we are trying to apply here is the discrete dipole approximation, which certainly works in the system. I mean, it converges numerically, and so to say, the theoretical approach also converges, if you wish. If you are capable of, capable of solving all the equations, you will get the exact solution of the thing. So now what we do is, okay, we compute the full incoming field for any dipole in the D particle as the external field we apply, E naught, will be a plane wave, whatever, but in this case we will be a randomized field, scrambled, at this particular frequency, plus the field coming from all the remaining dipoles inside particle D again, so except itself, the N, plus all the radiation scattered or coming from the other particle, all the dipoles on the other particle, right? Of course, we have the same thing for particle A, a very similar set of equations. And now we see that the total exciting field on any dipole in particle D and A is the external field, our random field, plus field that comes from the dipole excitations of other dipoles inside the particle and the other particle, right, here. So we link the total exciting field for a dipole with the fields exciting other dipoles in a self-consistent manner. This is super well known, sorry for repeating it again, but this is the basic uh, formalism we're, we're using here, there are other. And the point here is that, uh, okay, this is just linear in this case, there are no, no non-linear effects here. So we can, in principle, just solve this system of equations just by inversion. So we define the P matrix. Uh, the, this is uh, one way of writing the general P matrix in, in optics in this way. So we have uh, okay, what we call the GDP would be the green electric green tensors connecting connecting different dipoles in in this particle so this is uh, okay the, the type of, of equations we have to in principle solve if you want more details i invite you i encourage you to discuss with uh, with some muster this uh, afternoon because he is uh, developing a full code even including other things so you, you could discuss based on this so once we have the formal solution to this set of uh, self-consistent equations. We can write that the incoming field onto object D and D and A, sorry, will take this form. So it depends on the external field and it depends on the optical response of the different objects. And then there, there are interactions between these two objects. So the scattering of object, the light scatter from object A to B, and reciprocally from B to A, uh, plays a role here in this field. Okay, so this would be essentially exact, right? Now, having now the total fields for a given input fields, we can compute the forces in principle. And by the way, this can be this uh, input field can be anything. Can be a well-determined beam, but can be a random field. In principle, can be a component at this particular frequency of the black body radiation, no problem. We can add everything. So, as I said before, okay, in principle, we should also take care of the fluctuating dipoles, so uh, currents in each of the, of the objects. Uh, but since we are considering non absorbing materials and we are not working in equilibrium, so of course, you can always define a temperature, but the fluctuating electromagnetic field has nothing to do with this temperature. And we can crank up the laser essentially all, all we want, right? So we can overcome all the uh, forces coming from this term. So in principle, we just neglect this and we consider only the induced dipoles by the fluctuating electromagnetic field. So we have dipole times derivative of the fluctuating field, right? And of course, this is a time average at this frequency. So we average over a period, right, or several, right? And we average over the statistical realization of this field, right? 
So this is the average, uh, the average force. Okay. Now, doing this, uh, when we plug this external input field into the into the equations, what we find is that, as was said before, that everything comes from the correlations, the field-field correlations at different positions at, at this particular frequency. It turns out in this part system, which is homogeneous, that is proportional to the imaginary part of the of the green tensor. Okay. Doing so, we can also so we can calculate the forces, and we can also see that the forces are conservative, so they come from the gradient of a potential, and this is the form of the potential. So it's a trace formula, as we saw yesterday, but this is in principle general for any pair of objects here, given the correlation function for the field here, right? So if we measure, I, I, since I guess I have a few, like five minutes or less, uh, thank you. I won't discuss too much uh, on the details of the of the experiment. So, when one directly plugs the the simplest theory, probably then you are, one has to do some approximations here. But anyways, you plug this theory onto the measured uh, forces using these uh, time shear traps for different powers in the optical field, uh, I mean the laser creating this, different sizes of the particles, etc., which are metacrylate particles in this case, you see that the predictions pretty well fit, uh, not quite always, but reasonably well, the predictions for a range of distances all the way down that to almost contact, right? So in principle, we can extrapolate the measure potentials to the contact positions, so we can measure from this way, get a value for the contact energy between these two particles, the contact potential given by this random light, okay? One of the predictions in this model was, okay, if we use dielectric non-resonant particles, the potential next to contact will be always attractive, no matter what you do, essentially, it's not in on resonance, but if we use dielectric no absorption particles in resonance, depending on the frequency of this random field, contact interactions can be, I mean, or, or short range interactions uh, can be repulsive or attractive, right? So why? In principle is because for each of those little particles, not only electric dipoles excitations are, are, are come into play, but also magnetic dipole excitations, right? So we, when we consider both electric and magnetic dipole excitations, so here I saw that you need a pretty high refractive index to do so, then the interactions can be tuned to be attractive or repulsive depending on the frequency of the random field, right? So uh, can we use this to create different interactions? The answer is as a matter of principle, yes, I will skip this discussion. I'd be glad to, uh, glad to discuss with you all this. The thing is, for creating incredible optical materials, let me say, we need an interaction potential between pairs of particles, NM, taking this form. So it's a spherical vessel function of some critical k times the distance divided by the k the distance, which as far as I can tell, it doesn't exist naturally. Uh, but we can, in principle, try to induce this potential Okay, I, I will skip the formulas. Using r more or less realistic uh, small particles in silicon, we can uh, play with the different wavelengths. Di we have to combine different wavelengths inducing these forces, repulsive, attractive, properly combining them with the appropriate power level for each of those lines. In principle, we can create uh, interaction here, the, the, there are two lines here. There is a green line, and there is a blue line. So it's what we want and what we get. So you can hardly see the difference. This is the residual of the interaction potential uh, for different correlation parameters, never mind different structures in this case that would form under this interaction potential and different packing fraction, real packing fractions in the system, right? So. For a range of different structural parameters, in principle, those structures would self-assemble subject to these interactions 
uh, combined in different lines. Probably you don't see the lines here, but the, the point here is we allow within a very wide range of wavelengths here. Uh, we, we allow the energy density to be whatever it takes, but when you minimize to get the potential you want, only a few lines of the order of 10 laser lines would be needed to recreate this, uh, this potential. So in principle, this is an affirmative answer to the question of can we design forces using random fields. Since I'm seriously running out of time, my count is 41 minutes. So I had 40. Yeah, I will completely skip this part on what happens when we include also absorption in the system but it's still way out of equilibrium. So we can play with different terms here and in principle we can, we can get uh, different forces. I let you that the, the advertisement for this paper was published a few years ago. So just to summarize, uh, okay, probably I can, I can leave the, the thing here. So I was trying a bit to convince you that the idea of using soft matter systems, colloidal systems in particular, to study interactions induced by random optical fields is a good idea, in particular for the black body radiation or perhaps studying zero point fluctuations. It's a good idea to use this kind of system, I guess. I don't really need to work too hard to convince you on this. Um, the point is that depending on the type of particles, in particular when we have particles with uh, colloidal particles with strong magnetic response. And I mean by this, in scattering, there is no intrinsic magnetic response in the material. The permeability is one all the way in, and all the time in, in the systems, but we can induce magnetic responses at optical frequencies. And so in principle, we could design forces which are not found naturally in the in the between the colloids uh, to study different interactions, right? So there, there is a chance that you want an interaction potential. You write it on a paper, and Augusta Muster will give you the combination of lines of laser lines and energies you, you need to put. If you are brave enough, you will do the experiment. We are studying now, okay, what's going on with the many body interactions. One can show that the, for many particles, the two body interaction will take always this shape, exactly. So the two body interaction is a superposition, on, I mean the full two body interaction is a superposition of pair interactions. The three body or four M body interaction in a, in a big system of even resonant particles is another uh, business, so to say we're dealing with it. And um, of course, nothing to say experimentally is challenging. I try to convince people to do experiments, but they never, they never want. Yeah. And yet not everything is so horribly difficult and bad, you know, at least for, as I said, for, for, for assemblies of N equivalent particles, we can prove that the, how the pair interaction will be. As I said, we are testing now the, the, the embedding in interaction. So yeah, please uh, ask Augusta Muster about the technical details, right? Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much.